Hi, this is Sabin Bhartia and welcome to TFR Insights. And today we have with us Don McLean, Chief Cybersecurity Technologist at DLT, a tech data company. We are all working from home these days, which actually poses a lot of you know unique uh, security challenges that we never experienced before. Uh, Companies or employees, they would go in the safe haven in the behind their corporate, you know, firewalls and all the production that are there. And suddenly everybody is outside of that castle working from home, using VPNs and all those, you know, even using Zoom. So first of all, what I want to understand from you is what kind of security, you know, problems that this unique situation creates when people are not inside that castle. Working from home is fairly common these days anyway. So I'm not sure that the there are any unique or different challenges. I think it's just a matter of uh, exacerbating the challenges that are already in place. Uh, one of those challenges is to make sure that all of the employees understand what they are supposed to be doing. So there's right away there's uh, an awareness and training issue. You know, do they know what software to use? Are they making sure? If, you know, VPNs have their problems, but uh, it's better to have, if you have them in place and you're using them, it's better to make sure that they're turned on. Not every installation turns on a VPN automatically when you, uh, when you connect uh, to, the, um, to the home, sh the mothership, the home network. Uh, make sure that employees know that they should be turning, turning that on, for instance. Uh, incident response uh, is going to be perhaps, was going to be complicated. It's going to be more difficult. Uh, do employees know how to get help for their systems if they're working from home and may have difficulty bringing their machines into the office, for, uh, for instance, uh, for some sort of maintenance or, or, or update. My general uh, outlook on this is that th there's lots of um, tips and tricks for how to be secure at home out there. I would offer this. Maybe from the security or IT professional standpoint, take a look at your overall security program. You know, what's different or what's more complicated about access control? Is your log data uh, picture going to be different? Are you able to collect the logs and uh, behavioral analysis that you were able to collect before? Uh, is there more coming into certain locations? Is there less coming in than, than you'd like? Obviously, the physical um, Security is going to be different. You, you know, uh, you've got laptops perhaps that are meant to be used or, or desktops that are meant to be used at, uh, in the office that now perhaps have been suddenly repurposed uh, to be used at home. So my rec general recommendation is to take a broad, comprehensive look at all of your security aspects and see what's different. Can you respond to incidents in the same way? Do you need more uh personnel, uh, you know, uh, on the phones, for instance, or uh, do you need to extend their hours uh, to to handle incidents that may be a little bit more complicated to deal with than if they were just down the hall, uh, you know, in the office, that, that kind of thing. Just in general, look at your ability to continue operations. I mean, the, the real issue here is, I think, the ability to, to continue to operate, the continuity of our operations plans, the business continuity plan, whatever you choose to call it. And have you have you reviewed that recently? And is it standing up to uh, the, the tests that I hope you've been doing uh, prior to this, uh, to this current situation? Because of this change, a lot of companies have now started with actually uh, uh, build remote working as part of their strategy that we should be prepared for that. So once this crisis is over, there are a lot of lessons they can learn, and most importantly, from the security point of view. So what do you think? Uh, I will come to all those the tips that you mentioned, but I just want to understand the problem a bit. So a lot of companies are struggling with that. So what do you think are will be the leftover, will be left you know, from, from this crisis that will actually benefit the industry in terms of how they look at security and their infrastructure? Well, certainly the scale of, of this is probably one of the biggest issues that's facing uh, companies or federal uh, federal agencies. Uh, you know, is your, are you able to scale up uh, to a sudden surge in work from home capacity? Uh, 
do you uh, do you and by scale I mean both uh, bandwidth uh, capacity for incoming uh, work from home uh, capability. If you're doing remote desktop, do you have adequate cap capability in store for that? Have you exploited cloud uh, the, the ability of the cloud to scale up uh, rapidly and in response to sudden uh, changes of events? And also, the scale issue also involves the the personnel. Uh, involved the support people who are probably uh, going to have to do a lot more work and maybe have to cover some issues that perhaps are not strictly speaking within their purview. For instance, if a home user's Wi-Fi goes out, that's not really the purview of an IT person, say at the Pentagon, but it Im impacts their ability to do their work. You know, wh where do you draw the line and how do you make the determination of, you know, and how do you advise that home user whom to call and how to rectify that issue? And how do you determine that it is, in fact, their Wi-Fi and perhaps not some other intervening issue? So I, mean, I would say the biggest thing is probably the, the scale issue, because, you know, an overlooked aspect of cybersecurity is the availability piece. You know, the three pillars of cybersecurity are confidentiality, integrity and availability. Availability uh, in, uh, is often overlooked as a, as a key element. And to make systems available, you have to address the scale issue, both from a technical standpoint, that is in terms of what can your systems um, absorb, uh, you know, in terms of their of bandwidth and uh, capacity, and also your personnel, uh, you know, issues. What are they able to uh, respond to? Can you scale your pe people up on a, on a short notice, on short notice as well? Um, so I, I would say those would be probably the lessons learned from this. What I hope is that people do actually sit down and do lessons learned after after this is over uh, and, and say, hey, look, what do we need to do to accommodate uh, uh, another potential crisis of this nature or some other nature uh, that requires a sudden work from home uh, surge? So it's very important. You know, lessons learned are great. But they're not learned if you don't sit down and codify them and meet with people. And all too often, I've seen crises happen in the agencies where I've done my work, where the crisis happens and people are so relieved that it's over and want to get back to work that that's what they do, which is understandable. It takes a little bit of extra discipline to sit down and make sure that you do that lessons learned. Say, hey, what worked? What didn't work? Where is our capacity deficient? Where was our capacity sufficient? And uh, what what strategies do we need to have in place to ensure that we can continue to operate in the event of another emergency? But one thing more we have seen as uh, Microsoft Azure said, they have seen a spike of like 700% or more than that towards people moving to the cloud. So a lot of, you know, uh, they're moving from on-prem to cloud, but the problem is that they cannot bring all those security implications they had in place, policies uh, or identity management, a lot of things as they move to cloud, suddenly they have to do that. So that also creates another set of risk. Uh, plus, uh, they cannot, I don't know, if they can send their actually engineers to the data center, you know, to actually patch as if there are them. And suddenly there is a spike in attacks also. So there are two four questions. Number one is that as they struggle to move their workloads to the cloud, how do they make sure that it, they still maintain the same security policies? And second piece is how do they ensure that their, 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 their software, their code is patched uh, and they're keeping up with all the CVs that are coming out? Well, you know, cloud installations are managed remotely anyway. So, I mean, that that's actually, uh, this could actually be a, a strong stimulus to, to continue to move to the cloud or to complete the move to the cloud because uh, you're not going to be working uh, you know, if you're working at the Pentagon or if you're working in a U.S. Uh, federal civilian agency, you don't have physical access to Amazon's data center anyhow. So I think that this might be a good a good uh, opportunity to say, hey, look, you know, the cloud really gives us a lot of advantages. We we manage, the, we do the patching uh, remotely anyhow. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, we also want to make sure that the patching is done um on time and, and and sufficiently, uh, any product I would say that allow that gives you additional time to do that is very helpful. I think Polyverse uh, is probably is one of those. Um, the uh, the other 
uh, aspect of this is that in a crisis, your IT folks are likely to be strained and short of time uh, in a way that they're not normally um, asked, you know, to do. That they ha- they have to they have to prioritize. Patching is already widely uh, considered a less a lower priority item, anyhow. Uh, so, uh, you know, and in a crisis, your IT folks are probably not going to make that their top priority. You know, e- even if they make it a priority now. So any. Any system that allows you to facilitate patching or keep systems running without having to worry about whether their their patches are up to date with the latest zero days, and there's a surge of zero days because of this whole crisis, uh, is advantageous. I think a product like Polyverse uh, addresses that uh, issue, addresses that need, because with Polyverse, uh, obviously you want to keep your systems patched, but it defeats a lot of attacks before they're even uh, known and before they even hit the streets or you know hit the, hit, uh, are up here in the wild, so to speak. So um, that uh, that I think addresses the the issue that you're talking about. So I mean, l- look at this as a a chance to move more aggressively toward the cloud and also to um, also to look at systems that give you some leeway, give you some uh, time. Um, relief in how fast and how quickly you have to patch. Since you mentioned Polyverse, so just to give a context to our viewers, can you explain uh, or just give an overview of the polymorphic model that they follow where every system kind of becomes unique, you know, uh, so you're not running the same Ubuntu or Red Hat or whatever uh, everybody else is running? Yeah, well, Polyverse, uh, they have uh, several different product lines, but I think the most uh, uh, relevant one or most uh, one, one of their signature approach is polymorphic Linux, which is or polymorphic operating systems. What they What that basically does is to move things around in memory so that they're not in predictable locations, allowing the um, allowing various uh, kinds of hacks and various kinds of exploits to, to be done the same way on every machine. It's still possible to exploit a, a machine that's protected with polymorphic malware, but that exploit will not work on the next machine that is uh, also um, uh, protected the same way because the memory layout is different. It's like uh, address space layout randomization, but much, much, much more uh, sophisticated and much more difficult to to exploit. The advantage is really that not that it makes these machines impregnable. I think anyone making that claim is uh, probably not uh, being completely you know candid, but it makes it difficult to uh, multi- to get the multiplier effect of a given exploit. If you one exploit works on one machine, it doesn't work on a hundred million machines or fifty million machines. It takes away the economic advantage. Of, well, uh, to to borrow a, a current term, it flattens the curve, so to speak. Um, you know, uh, the uh, the economy of scale is is gone. Uh, the the um, hacker gets one machine and. Um, Okay, so they get one machine, but they don't get the next one. So that that's really the big advantage of this. Uh, similar uh, related technology is polyscripting, in which keywords that are known to the attacker are altered on the target machine so that even if they were to figure out what the translated uh, keywords are in a given language, PHP, JavaScript, whatever, uh, they might work it out. They might be able to figure it out on one machine, but again, it'll be different on the next. So their economy of scale is gone. You've raised their level of effort uh, and the cost benefit uh, is is no longer there. So that's really what uh, Polyverse is. Uh, is all about, and it's one of the reasons that I, I find them very attractive uh, and groundbreaking technology. So, does that also mean that if there are any known CVs or you know uh, uh, bugs there, uh, you can literally kind of ignore them because your system is kind of uh, pr- protected against them? Is that so that you can you know if you're working from home, you can say, hey, you know what, we don't have to rush in and you immediately you know push all those patches. Any exploit that relies on. Uh, Things being in, in uh, known areas of memory, and there are a lot of exploits like that. Uh, I wouldn't, you know, you, you never want to ignore them, but you can you can feel that you're safe uh, against them because they're not going to work on a polymorphic or a polyverse protected ma- machine. Uh, for instance, the um, the uh, uh, the recent um, 
weaknesses that were found in the Intel chips are not going to be uh, uh, are not going to be a problem for you. Okay, because uh, those have to do with um, with memory layout and memory predictable uh, pieces of code being in predictable places in memory. Those don't work with, on a polymorphic uh, machine. You know, those are. Um, you know that's an example of a, a pretty uh, pretty comprehensive protection against a lot of zero days. N- there's no silver bullet; it's not going to protect against everything, but it certainly is going to protect a lot. And it gives you you, you want to keep your systems patched, of course, but it gives you a little bit of leeway, a little bit of breathing room in the event of uh, a crisis or uh, a difficult situation such as this one. Do you have any suggestions, some tips that people who are working from home remotely can follow just to make sure that, you know, they are they are still, you know, they can continue the business without uh, risking uh, their infrastructure or, or their machines? Whatever security guidelines your organization provides, be sure to follow those. Um, be particularly cognizant of any kind of phishing attacks that are seeking to very cynically and evilly uh, exploit the current situation. There's an uptick in all of those things. If something seems suspicious, you know, please call your your IT support group. At the same time, be cognizant that they are probably uh, a little bit more strained and stressed than normal. So uh, be, be be patient with them, and um, be sure to you you know be sure to follow all the guidelines. You may you may feel frustrated and want to engage in some shadow IT, putting data in places that it shouldn't normally go, simply because you may be constrained by some aspect of working at home, bandwidth, uh, uh, a little bit different working environment. But please don't yield to that temptation. Uh, don't don't put data out on uh, you know a public source uh, that is not authorized. Don't engage in shadow IT. Um, those would be some of the uh, guidelines that I, that I would offer. Uh, be more cognizant of security in general than less. Uh, you know, this is not a license to be, um, you know, to, to just um, engage in your own way of doing things. Uh, Don, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule and talking to me and actually giving us not only some tips, but also talking about, you know, how to how to work remotely, but in a very safe and secure manner. And I look forward to seeing you in person at some point. Thank you. Yes, I hope uh, I hope to do so. And uh, thank you, actually, for uh, for having me, Swapnil.